This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand. Southern Remedies, Relatively Speaking, is a show that explores issues that relate to you and your family. To find out what we're all about, subscribe to the podcast by using any podcast app or by downloading our MPB Public Media app. From MPB Think Radio, this is Southern Remedy Women's Health, where we discuss issues involving women's health. I'm Dr. Jasmine Kinsey, Assistant Professor of Internal Medicine and Pediatrics at UMMC. 40 to 50 million surgical procedures are carried out every year. All of the people undergoing these procedures require some type of anesthesia. Today we have Dr. LaToya Mason-Bolden on with us. She is a professor of anesthesiology at UMC and a fellow of the American Society of Anesthesiologists. So she is here to be talking about this topic further with us, and I'm so excited to have her here. So welcome to the show. Thank you, Dr. Kinsey. Well, that makes two of us because I'm super excited to be here as well. Thank you again for the invitation and the awesome opportunity. So when I, LaToya and I were kind of chatting, I told her I'm excited about this show mainly because I'm about to learn a lot. I get a lot of questions from my patients in clinic before surgical procedures, and they're like, Dr. Kinsey, what is going to happen? And I was like, I've got a very surface understanding of what's going to happen. So I am. I promise listeners, I am learning with you guys. Guys, and, and hopefully we'll be able to take a lot of this back to my patients as well. But LaToya, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do. Yes, yeah, so um, I am a native of Jackson, Mississippi, born and raised here. Um, life has pretty much gone full circle for me. After graduating from Jackson Public Schools, I was um, Forest Hills' first African-American um, valedictorian back then. Um, I went on to Xavier University, then Tulane for medical school. Um, I did an OB anesthesia fellowship at Baylor College of Medicine, where I stayed on faculty for about 10 years, and it's really been a great joy to come back to my home community and work at UMMC as an OB anesthesiologist. I'm actually um, one of the only, if not the only, anesthesiologist in our state who has completed subspecialty fellowship training in OB anesthesia. So that's kind of uniquely poised me to really provide service to women um, as they undergo childbirth. But hey, I have administered anesthesia to every kind of a patient, males, females, children. I'm just happy to be able to keep safe in such a vulnerable time. Yes, well, that well, definitely we know that your, your resume shows that you're more than qualified to talk about this topic today for pretty much all of our patient populations. And so I have learned in medicine that I cannot assume that people always know what we're talking about. And I didn't even know until I went to medical school and I learned more about all the different areas of medicine and what it is exactly that they do. So can you tell me more about anesthesiology. What is anesthesia? What does that mean? So just from literal terms, anesthesia um, is translated as no pain, you know, no dolor for the Spanish speakers out there in the audience. And it's really defined as an insensitivity, especially it's, it's artificially induced. It's something that's necessary um, for when a person undergoes what's going to be a surgical stimulus, such as a, a surgery, a procedure. Hey, nobody wants to be awake for that. And you certainly don't want to feel the pain. So it's a necessary medium. We give uh, a combination of agents. It can be gases. It It can be medications through your veins, through an IV, and it's all a combination to make sure that we keep you vitally safe. You know, we're always watching your blood pressure, your heart rate, your oxygenation, trying to get you through that surgical um, operation and let you wake up in recovery and go on and continue to live a wonderful life. And I will be honest, when I talk to patients about surgery, A, I either get nobody's cutting on me. And so sometimes I'm just like, unfortunately, you know, we're at that point where where, where we got to get something done. But right after the idea of them actually having to go under the surgical procedure, I think the anesthesia part gives people so much anxiety because we were actually talking about this walking in. We all in our mind think about we hear propofol and we all go straight to Michael Jackson and you get in the room and you see somebody hang up this white 
white substance and you're like that's the Michael Jackson medicine like don't give that to me like <laughs> so all that to say is we know that there are different types of anesthesia and all those kind of things so what are the different types of anesthesia that people get so broadly speaking um, anesthesia you can think of it as um, into four categories we'll think about general anesthesia we can think about regional anesthesia we can think about local anesthesia and then something called conscious sedation or MAC and you know funny that you mentioned um, the, uh, Michael Jackson and Hollywood because it has definitely had an impact on my practice because rarely a week goes by that someone won't make reference to, hey, are you going to use that? They call it the milk of amnesia because if you've ever seen propofol, it looks just like milk that's going into your veins. And we just have to always reassure the patient that, hey, it's a great drug. Actually, it represents one of the um, best um, inventions um, or implementations into anesthesia because it's, it's a clean drug, but you want to make Make sure that it falls into the right hands. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about those four major types, um, general anesthesia is actually the only type where a person will be really completely asleep. With the other types, you can have varying levels of sedation um, depending upon, you know, what needs to be the surgical goal. You know, there are some procedures out there where you, where the surgeon actually needs the patient to be able to elicit a response. You know, I'm thinking about if a person's having a neural stimulator placed. It's important, of course, for you to have some level of sedation, you know, to tolerate their, just being there. But also, they want to confirm that they're in the right place. So at the right time in the procedure, they'll ask us to lift, per se, the anesthesia the anesthetic level so that the patient can respond, you know, confirming that their instrumentation is in, in place correctly. Then other times, you know, if you're having a major surgery, cardiac surgery, heart surgery, um, abdominal surgery, something that's going to be a little bit longer, something that's going to be a little bit more complex, then you want to be totally asleep for that. Yes, please. <laughs> it sounds painful. So I don't think anyone wants to wake up in the middle of any of those. <laughs> You're absolutely right. And when you talk about, um, you know, waking up, I think about Hollywood again. And, you know, there's been lots of interesting movies out there. And some of them uh, kind of allude to awareness and anesthesia and people mm -hmm. waking up. But I really do want to reassure the listeners out there that that's, that that should be not a concern of yours. Anesthesia is very carefully titrated for every single person. Um, I love to use cliches in my vernacular. And one of the things I always tell people is that anesthesia is not one size fits all. Okay, it's not a magic light that we walk in the room and flip it on when we know about the surgery is going to start and flip it off when they're closing. No, absolutely not. Um, and that's why it's so important that your, your anesthesia is administered by a physician anesthesiologist-led team. And we work with other individuals, our nurse anesthetists, resident physicians, anesthesiology assistants. Someone from our team is always by your side every single heartbeat watching and making sure that we titrate just the right, right amount of medication just for you. Well, that I think that probably gives people a lot of relief because you probably you see these movies and you're like, oh, the anesthesiologist put them asleep and they're walking out the room. And then there's a surgeon that's still doing surgery. And then you hear like bells go off in the movies and then the anesthesiologist is running back in. So I think that probably eases some people to know that somebody from the team is there at all times watching your procedure, making sure that you're you're doing OK. And so I think another important part that you mentioned is every time we think about having a a procedure, you mentioned general anesthesia. So that's what I think of right away, oftentimes, where they are like, I am out and I'm not going to remember anything that happened. But you kind of touched a little bit on, you know, again, being in medicine, I'm learning so much more, more about like, what is procedural sedation versus general? And when do I have to have that tube? That's the other thing that gives people a lot of anxiety that, you know, they're going to put that breathing tube down. And you, so how, how do we determine when we need that versus... Sure, that's Just a great like question. And so it's a it's it's an answer that is multifactorial. We take a look at the patient. We take a look at what is the procedure that the person's going to be having done. Is it going to be something that's short or long? Um, and, you know, just how invasive is it really going to be? So when we think about... Um, Placing the breathing tube. That's something that I think is very scary to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So what I do want to reassure people is that that breathing tube is going to be placed after you're asleep. Unless you have a very specific um, 
anomaly or something that would preclude you needing to have that done awake, by large, I can honestly say that the vast, vast majority of people, this is stuff that happens after you are asleep. And then before you really come to and know what's going on, we remove it. Now, you may know that you've had something in your throat just because your throat may be a little bit scratchy or Mm -hmm. just might feel like something's been there that's not normally there. Um, But we are very gentle um, the, your anesthesiologist, your physician anesthesiologists are very well trained. You know, the, the average anesthesiologist has completed at least 12 years of training, um, plus had like 12,000 to 16,000 hours logged. And we're made for this moment. I'm borrowing that from the American Society of Anesthesiologists. You know, we're made for this moment, and it's your moment to undergo anesthesia and just have comfort in knowing that your team is well prepared to take care of you and get you through that moment. That's awesome because I won't lie, when I saw the anesthesiologist as I was doing my rotations in medical school, I was like, I can go in and check this off the list. I'm not designed to do this. Kind of kept it moving. As you can see, I'm a talker, so I need everybody awake and, and all that kind of stuff when I'm interacting with them. But we appreciate our internists so much. <laughs> and in fact, anesthesiologists like to think of themselves as the internists of the OR. I love it. Because what people may or may not realize is, yes, your surgeon is doing that procedure, but it's up to your anesthesiologist to kind of keep everything else in check and mm-hmm. in an equilibrium. You know, so while my patients are asleep, I'm making sure their blood pressure is where they need to be. I'm making Making sure that if they're diabetic, I'm checking their glucose at intervals. Um, I'm keeping a lookout on how much blood may be getting lost and if a person needs to be transfused or not. And even, you know, I think of anesthesiologists, we are our patient's advocate when Mm -hmm. they can't advocate for themselves. You know, you even think about when you go to sleep at night, you might like to have a pillow under your right arm or something. Well, believe it or not, we're very intentional about everything we do. Like uh, right before we go to sleep, we carefully pad people and make sure their pressure points are protected. Um, We make sure that their eyes are well lubricated. We really are being their advocate Mm -hmm. when they cannot advocate for themselves. That is awesome. And again, I have with me Dr. LaToya Mason Bolding, a professor of anesthesiology at UMC and a fellow of the American Society of Anesthesiologists. And we have just been spending this first little time during the session talking a little bit about what is anesthesia? What are the different types of anesthesia, general anesthesia versus local anesthesia? Um, and just kind of getting the basis of what happens um, when you're going in for a surgical procedure from the anesthesia standpoint. So I get a lot of questions about this in clinic. So I know you all have a lot of questions. And so I was telling LaToya that um Probably one of the most stressful things for women, particularly when you're having a baby, is trying to decide about whether or not getting an epidural. Now, I got to cheat a little bit because I went to medical school and I got to rotate on ob and I saw women with medicine and I saw women without medicine. And so as soon as I got to the hospital, anybody that walked in that room was aware that I wanted an epidural. It, you could have been coming to take my trash out and I I was telling you, did, did, did they tell you I want an epidural? Like, when is that going to happen? Like, everyone, my husband teased me because everyone that walked in that room was aware because no one was going to tell me that I had no time left to get an epidural. But for everybody, I tell, you know, you have to do what works for your family. Epidural may not be for everyone. So tell us a little bit about that. <laughs> so wonderful question. And I have to say, you know, I think that you are not alone, Dr. Kinsey, um, how a lady chooses to manage her her pain of labor is a very real concern. And the more that individuals can learn about that uh, before they go, get to the hospital and are in labor, I think, it, I know, not I think, I know it helps them to make a, a really good decision because it's all about knowing that our patients have the, you know, the right to receive pain relief during labor and they can manage it any way that they would like to. And just because a person goes into it saying, hey, I'm going to try this natural birth thing out, I'm going to start off trying that. You can change your mind, you know, mm-hmm. if it, you get you feel the contraction or two or what you think might be a little bit of contraction and you change your mind. No problem. We can conf- we can I'm confident that our teams can safely get an epidural in, you know, unless you're maybe a person is almost completely dilated and literally about to, you know, push the baby. But, you know, an epidural, uh, a, a good way to think of it would be um 
It's like a, a long, thin plastic catheter. And basically, we ask our moms to very carefully uh, position themselves. Specifically, they'll usually be sitting upright and kind of curl around their baby. And I ask individuals to just hug your sweet baby, hug your sweet baby. And that not only allows you to bond with your, your child, but also it allows you to push those back bones out so that we can really palpate or feel exactly where we need to go. Now, um, from that point, we, we quickly, uh, as quickly as we can, kind of numb the area. And that might be the only time where you might feel a little bit of a pinch or a little bit of a sting where we give some local anesthesia in the area where we're going to work. But after that, just take deep breaths, and you should just feel pressure, and that allows us to engage a very special space in your back called the epidural space, and we actually leave that long, thin, flexible catheter. And the wonderful thing about that, and then we'll even like tape it in place, the mm-hmm. wonderful thing about an epidural you know, its its possibilities are endless because, you know, hopefully you go on to have an uneventful vaginal delivery. Um, but, but if something happens with your labor and you have to go to the OR, the wonderful thing about a good working labor epidural is that not only can we dose it with appropriate medications to help you tolerate contractions, but we can also top it off is the lingo that we like to use to give you something stronger if you needed to go for cesarean and you could still be awake for the birth of your baby. So I, we love a wonderful epidural. Our patients love a wonderful epidural because because, you know, a good working epidural allows you to be awake and experience and enjoy the joy of childbirth. Well, I had a wonderful epidural with the first baby because, like I said, everybody was aware. I got it in a timely fashion and didn't really feel much of the labor. Now, the other times, you know, it was a little tricky, but the first one was beautiful. So as we say that, people are terrified of there is a needle going into my back. I heard I could get paralyzed. What is that going to do for my baby? I'm worried about the medication getting to my baby. So, so how do you kind of educate your patients about those concerns and fears? Well, I want to reassure the audience by just letting you know that there is very, very little risk of paralysis from an epidural. So, you know, anesthesia, like so much of medicine, has been an evolution. You know, when you know better, now that you can do better. So in the past, some of the culprits for people maybe having some nerve damage that they attributed to around the time of their epidural really wasn't the epidural itself, but when we think about how we um, used our antiseptics, like um, local anesthetic used to be stored in bottles, glass bottles that were cleansed with alcohol. Now, alcohol Alcohol does nerve damage. Um, So it was more a product of the way that um, our medications were being uh, prepared rather than the procedure itself. There's really, really, really no reason for individuals to feel like they're going to come out of it paralyzed or anything even near to it. Now, common side effects. It's common to feel a little bit of uh, a little bit of back pain or discomfort, mm-hmm. probably, um, right after your epidural, just from the site of injection. We, we use the smallest needles that are necessary to get that thin, flexible catheter in place. But besides maybe a little back discomfort, um, know that we are very, very careful to make sure that we get that epidural catheter in the right place. A subset of individuals can end up with a headache afterwards. Mm -hmm. Um, But even if that happens, we have really good ways to treat that headache. So I definitely would not want anyone in the listening audience to have the fear of paralysis to really cause them to just eliminate an epidural from their regimen. Because once again, the possibilities are endless. You know, a good working epidural keeps us from having to put a mom to sleep for cesarean delivery. And while we are very well trained and capable of doing it, literature and physiology just tells us that whenever you can keep a mother awake, that's what you want to do. We really want to reserve going to sleep or general anesthesia for those cesarean deliveries that have a very specific indication or present themselves in such a stat or urgent fashion that we really don't have any other choice. 
Gotcha. And so with a good working epidural, what are the risks to my baby? You know, we worry about what are those or is there long term, not just short term, is there long term that we're aware of? Not that we are aware of. Epidurals are very safe. We like to think of them actually as the gold standard of labor analgesia because it's a safe technique. And then the medications that we give are safe. And then remember, um, whenever we give the epidural and place it, we have the the mother and the baby are being consistently, constantly monitored. So if we see a little bit of a drop in blood pressure, we know how to position mom accordingly Mm -hmm. and give her a little something to help um, mitigate those effects. So it's very safe for the mother and the baby. In fact, A good working epidural, because it allows mom to relax a little bit more and to perfuse and get blood to the baby a little bit more, a good working epidural actually can be beneficial to the baby rather than a mother who is having high blood pressure and um, breathing quickly because of the pain of labor that they are having a problem tolerating. Those are good points. And I just always like to remind the audience that's looking of, uh, or that's listening, not looking, that's listening, that, you know, you have to do what works for you and your family. So if, you know, your birth, this is why it's really nice to have a good birth plan, to talk with your OBGYN, to talk with your, you know, whether it's your doula, your midwife, or, or what that may be about what your your goals are as far as making uh, delivery a wonderful experience. But I just wanted to really kind of touch on that because I get, have so many moms that that, um, are are quite anxious about it. And I tell moms all the time, we have the same goal. We want you to be healthy. We want your baby to be healthy. And we want you to know what all your options are out there. Um, so thank you for sharing that with us. And I know a lot of you have questions. So don't forget that you can give us a call at one eight seven seven mpb ring That's one 672 7464 so we've kind of gotten a chance to hit a lot of uh, good topics about what anesthesia is, the different types. And so epidural, I guess we would kind of fall under the list of more local, I would say, um, than, than um, the general, like you said. Or, or even regional. Regional. OK, mm-hmm. there you sure, go. Sure, yes. Um, so we'll think of general. We'll think of local. We'll think of that conscious sedation. And then it can kind of fall under that umbrella of regional. OK. Perfect. So what about um, another part, another common procedure that I have for patients? So colonoscopy is a huge one. And despite so people are usually pretty anxious about the prep, but a lot of people are anxious about the anesthesia. So from my understanding, that's more of a procedural sedation than general anesthesia. Or what do you guys normally do in those situations? So we, we, we call that uh, that conscious sedation or a MAC. Gotcha. And so I can see how it can be an area of of area of gray area because we use propofol is one of the primary medications that we rely upon. And you know that you heard me talking about propofol in the setting of general anesthesia. Mm-hmm. So that's the wonderful thing about propofol. It's all in how you use it. It's a very dose dependent medication. So we can dose it light enough where a person can tolerate their colonoscopy and continue to breathe on their own and not require um, a tube in their throat. Or if we use propofol to put someone all the way to sleep, it's strong enough, that dose-dependent fashion, once again, where it can be strong enough to make a person go to sleep. But for most of your colonoscopies and, you know, the endoscopy sleeps, it's usually kind of a propofol party. Okay. You know, we're, tit- we're titrating propofol according to people's blood pressure, their heart rate, um, you know, to get them through that moment. Because nobody wants to really, I, I haven't met many people that want to be awake for their colonoscopy. I would have to agree on that one. I definitely would. Well, we actually have a caller. We have Todd in Jackson. Good morning, Todd. How are you? Hey, hey, good morning. Can you hear me okay? I can. I'm a retired eye surgeon who started going to the operating room in the 1970s. So I've seen the evolution of anesthesia. And I will tell you, surgeons cannot do their job without the anesthesia personnel. It is absolutely a team uh, a team activity, uh, the surgeon is focused on the mechanical aspect of what he's got, and the anesthesiologist is, or the anesthesia personnel are, are keeping you safe and alive while that's going on. <clears throat> and, and to make a point, uh, I absolutely uh, feel more safe going to the operating room for a major operation. I've had about eight than I do getting on a commercial airliner, which is the safest way to travel in the United States. So people should absolutely have no fear 
about when they need a procedure uh, going and having it taken care of. Um, the, uh, the monitoring techniques and the training of these people who take care of you uh, is extraordinary, and they don't get credit because they don't come out and speak to the family after the procedure ordinarily because they're starting their next case and the surgeon's coming out to talk to the family. Um, if I could say one other word about uh, epidural, uh, I know this is a ladies' program, but having had my own epidural under an, uh, an unusual circumstance, <clears throat> I think it points to the fact that anesthesia uh, care does not stop at the end of the operation. In my particular case, uh, in one instance, I had uh, a, a, a complicated uh, emergency abdominal procedure, <clears throat> and the anesthesiologist was well aware that I was going to have um, pain levels at the procedure that were going to inhibit my ability to get up and move, which is critical after major operations to get those patients up so they don't get blood clots in their leg and, and have a fatal uh, uh, pulmonary embolus. Mm -hmm. uh, in this case, the anesthesiologist left an indwelling epidural catheter, which I had for several days, and that that anesthesia would be turned down so I could get up and walk with the nurses as I needed to after the surgery, or I would have been incapacitated. So I, I think it's a mistake for people to think that the anesthesia care ends at the end of the operation. In many cases, it goes on uh, afterwards. The other thing that you guys have not mentioned, which I will just have you say a word about is uh, is what I call crash anesthesia. When you have a patient who is a critically injured, uh, has a critical situation, uh, the anesthesiologist has to know uh, how to handle those operations. You know, if you you just had a five course meal at a local restaurant and you're involved in an automobile accident, they have to know special things to make you safe while you're having your life saving uh, care. Uh, so it's absolutely uh, a team approach, and these people know an extraordinary amount. They don't get the credit for it. And that's all I have to say. Todd, I really appreciate that. That's awesome. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Todd, for your service and for those kind commendations. You know, Dr. Kinsey and I were just sitting here nodding in agreement at almost everything that everything that you were saying. I I'm so glad to hear your story and your personal experience with anesthesia, and I'm glad that you're doing really, really well. And, um, yes, it is a perioperative role. You know, as anesthesiologists, we really consider ourselves to be perioperative um, physicians. Of course, we want our patients to do well preoperatively in the OR, but even when you go home in those days after, we want to make sure that we're doing something to keep you safe, to keep you comfortable, to get you moving again as quickly and as painlessly as possible. I really liked that word that you said about patient safety because it really hit um hit right home into, when we think about anesthesiologists, a lot of people don't know that anesthesiologists are the first group of physicians who formally organize the Patient Safety Organization. The Anesthesia Patient Safety Foundation um, is dedicated purely to um, exploring more, doing more active research on how we can make anesthesia even more safe for our patients. And I want to speak to, um, you mentioned about uh, what happens in a stat case, in a trauma. Well, it goes back to how anesthesiologists, they've done that training that makes them ready for that moment. Of course, I practice at our state's only academic institution, which is a level one trauma center. And not a day goes by that we don't have to be prepared to execute a stat anesthetic plan to receive that patient who may have, you know, unfortunately been in an accident or suffered some kind of trauma. But once again, be reassured, the audience should be reassured that we are trained and ready for this moment to work as a team. Hey, what do they say? Teamwork makes the dream work. And it's <laughs> so, so true. You know, we've seen so many different scenarios and we are ready to take care of our patients to make sure that they have the safest, most appropriate anesthetic perioperative experience that they can have. Thanks again for your comments. That was awesome. From MPB Think Radio, this is Southern Remedy Women's Health, where we discuss issues involving women's health. I'm Dr. Jasmine Kinsey, and today I have with me Dr. LaToya Mason Bolden, who is a professor of anesthesia at UMC, and we have enjoyed spending the first half learning so much more about anesthesia and hopefully helping guys, uh, everyone that have may have some questions or been nervous, but we have got here Wyatt and Hazelhurst on the line. How are you, Wyatt? 
Hey, good morning. I'm well. How are y'all? Good. Good. Uh, first, I just wanted to, uh, for our guests, um, with those impeccable bona fides, uh, I appreciate uh, her willingness to come back home uh, to practice in Mississippi. Uh, clearly, she could practice wherever she chooses. Uh, so thank you for uh, making Mississippi your professional home. Uh, I had a question. Uh, our son uh, had um, a tooth put in his ear, and um, there was some discussion about whether or not he would have to be intubated versus the use of an LMA. And I was wondering if you could talk about when an LMA for a pediatric patient could be used instead of uh, full intubation. Sure. Thanks for calling, Wyatt, and thanks for your kind words. I appreciate that. It's a pleasure. It's an honor to serve my home state. Um, as far as uh, PE tubes, they are a really quick procedure, and quite honestly, it's not uncommon um, for us to do what we call mask anesthesia for those, um, because what we want to do, we want to make sure that our anesthetic never is bigger than the surgery itself. You know, we never want to present a larger risk with our anesthetic than the surgery itself. When you make mention of masking or even the LMA, that's an acronym for laryngeal mask airway. And that's an um, another evolution. It was actually invented by uh, Dr. Archie Brain, um, an anesthetist um, from across the pond from over in the UK, a couple of decades ago. And it's really been a game changer for anesthesia because um, it's a soft, flexible tube that um, just kind of rests right there in the laryngeal area, a little bit above the vocal cord. So it's less invasive in that we don't have to absolutely go through the vocal cords. Um, And we're able to deliver, of course, the gases of anesthesia to make sure our patients are asleep for their surgery. Now, who might get an LMA um, and who may not be a good candidate for an LMA. Uh, the biggest thing I can think of is if we are a if we encounter a patient who has a history of bad um, reflux disease, um, heartburn, then an LMA would not be um, they would not be a candidate for that because it's all about we want to be able to ultimately protect the airway, and so really most of our children. Um, if they're young and healthy, um, and I, I make a disclaimer, you know, I'm not a pediatric anesthesiologist, um, but just generally speaking, if the children are pretty healthy with the exception of just needing those ear tubes, um, they're not at high risk for heartburn or refluxing, which would present them as a risk for aspiration, then then it's, it's very reasonable for a lot of these PE tubes to be done under an LMA or some other mask procedure. I hope that helps to offer some... Um, some clarification for you on that topic. Thank you for that question, Wyatt. And we're going to move on to our next caller. We have Angela in Laurel, Mississippi. Hi, good morning. How are you, Angela? I'm well, thank you. How are you? I'm good. Great. Just a quick question for you. So I, I am aware that different medical practitioners use um, some senses more than others. So which senses do you use most in performing the optimal anesthesia uh, procedure? I think I heard you say some senses. I'm, I'm not sure, but thanks for calling in, Miss Angela. What I'll say is, um, you know, I'll confess, I am also a musician. I'm a classically trained pianist and violinist. And the reason why I mention that is because I often try to tune into the music of the OR. When I'm teaching residents or when I'm doing an anesthetic, I tell people, hey, everybody, let's tune into the music of the OR. And that reminds me when you're talking about senses, you know, Obviously, your anesthesia team is keeping their eyes wide awake on everything that's happening, but really, you could close your eyes, and if you listen to the OR, the music of the OR, you know what's going on. If I hear a heart heart rate going faster, I know that my patient might need a little bit more pain medicine. If I'm listening to pitches, you know, that gives me good information about how well my patient is getting oxygen or not. So, I think you said senses, um, and then when I think about being an OR, be anesthesiologist, when I place an epidural, that's all about what I feel. You know, your anesthesiologist takes time to clean your back, um, maintain sterile technique, but we carefully feel your backbones to anticipate what is that exact place we need to place that needle to get that epidural where it needs to be. So that's a, just a little bit of how we use our senses, eyes, ears, um, you know, and, and feeling just to make sure we're delivering a safe, effective anesthetic that's appropriate for each patient. Okay, thank you so much. 
Thank you for your question, Angela. And I'm happy, LaToya, that you clarified a little bit to us about an LMA mm -hmm. versus actually requiring the uh, endotracheal tube and kind of some of those procedures. So all the time, we don't have to always use that tube. And I will say, you mentioned a little bit about um, some discomfort sometimes with the intubation. Is there anything that you guys do that can help with that or... Or afterwards, what the patient can do to prevent any irritation? Well, sure. A lot of the, um, I just want to reassure that we try to be as careful and as gentle as we can because we recognize, you know, anytime you're placing something in a person that's not normally there, there's going to be the potential for some discomfort and some, you know, lasting effects. But we do tell people whatever um, medication that they're getting from their surgeon to help control the pain from their surgery is probably going to be able to help allay any throat discomfort, but then also I, I, I can make my patients laugh when I say, hey, this is your excuse to use to eat calorie-free ice cream. So I'm like, do you like ice cream or warm soup? Well, hey, if your throat is bothering you in any way, once you're fully awake, um, this is your chance that you can have ice cream um, calorie-free. I like it. <laughs> no, I, I asked that just because that seemed to be like a common thing that I get from my patients is, you know, my throat is still hurting. Did they do something wrong? Is everything OK? Or, or so it sounds like the expectation is and my understanding is that you can have a little discomfort post uh, intubation and have a little bit of irritation and things like that. Mm -hmm. When should they be worried? Because every now and then, like so we have this wonderful system. Many patients know that are listening called my chart where you can send your questions to the doctor. So sometimes the anesthesiologist mm -hmm. is not on that list. So I get, I had, you know, I had my procedure a couple of days ago and I'm still having a sore throat. When should a person be worried afterwards? So I would say there should be concern if you find that it's getting worse and not better. So I think that's always a great rule of thumb. If you feel like, you know, hey, from all the anesthesiologists out there, we apologize if you're having discomfort. I get it, you know. But if it's getting um, worse and not better, I would be concerned. And then also those individuals that tend to be more challenging for us to secure their airway, have comfort in knowing that your anesthesiologist is going to alert you. Um, those individuals who may have had a more sore throat than others, Maybe something caused it to be a difficult intubation. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, we do a really good job of giving patients documentation to let them know that, hey, you know what? We took care of your airway, but it wasn't exactly straightforward. We had to do, you know, A, B, and C when we normally might have to do only A. So for those reasons, that could kind of give a patient a heads up. And those individuals, we might even just give them an extra dose of um, like a steroid boost or something to make sure that it tries to um, mitigate some of the inflammation that might okay. in, um, ensue. But really, to answer your question, I would tell them, you know your body better than anybody else. And if this pain, this discomfort is not going down, but it's rather getting um, worse, or if it's accompanied by a new hoarseness or something like that, that would be reason to reach out sooner than later. Okay. Perfect. So another kind of common question I get that I don't really, I guess, know all the literature behind it or what an anesthesiologist recommendation is, is I'll get people that say, well, my mom had a problem with anesthesia. Does that automatically mean that you're more genetically predisposed to issues with anesthesia? Should I be worried if my mom or brother had an issue with it? So what I would say to that is it depends on what the problem was. So this is a perfect opportunity for me to just mention something called malignant hyperthermia. Now, that has a familial disposition. And if that runs in your family, your anesthesiologist absolutely 100 percent needs to know about that. So in, in most people who have a history of MH in their family, They've heard about it. Mm -hmm. um, but then other things like if my mom had a problem with anesthesia, we want to clarify what is that problem that they had and speak to it. And that just really kind of um, speaks again to the importance of meeting with your anesthesiologist before your procedure. When we think about surgical checklist and anesthesia checklist, the very important part of that process is preoperatively preoperatively, you should meet with your your physician anesthesiologist, and that's your forum to raise all of those questions. It's a two-way street. You know, of course, we are asking the patient about their medical history and their family history, but also it's an opportunity for the patient to interview their anesthesia provider and get all their questions answered. 
Awesome. We have had a great time learning a lot about anesthesia. So I'm going to hop on to our next caller so we'll have time. So we have Debbie in Biloxi. Good morning, Debbie. Good morning. How are you this morning? I'm preparing for surgery. <laughs> well, perfect. You, you're like, you listened in on the right morning, right? <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> yes, I just did my post-op, I mean, my pre-op today. So I just had a couple of questions about, um, is there always an intubation during surgery? So, um Not necessarily. It's going to really depend upon what surgery that a person is going to go for. And then just various different factors. Um, You can have the actual endotracheal to place through the vocal cords. Um, If Mm -hmm. it's appropriate, you may have a laryngeal mask airway just placed kind of uh, like in the laryngeal area of your throat. Or if you're having a procedure... uh, such as maybe even a hip replacement or a knee replacement, we may even be able to just do a spinal block. Or if you're having a cesarean, you may just have a spinal as well and be allowed to stay awake for the procedure. So to answer your question, it's not always an intubation. Okay, okay. I, I was just a little, um, I, I guess I was under the impression they just used a mask, but I guess they do that after you're um, asleep. So the mask is often one of the first things that people may remember. Um, We will start off by giving you a sedative through your IV. You know, the anesthetic can even start once we start to roll you from the preoperative suite all the way back to the OR. We'll kind of start our little cocktail of, you know, anti-anxiety medications. And um, it's not uncommon. We may say, hey, will you hold this mask for us and breathe into that? And we gently start to titrate medicines through the vein and also through the mask. So it's a combination. I see. Okay. Well, that, that changes my fear a little, and I appreciate your time today. Oh, and don't, don't be afraid. Just know that your anesthesia team is dedicated to taking excellent care of you, and I wish you the best on your upcoming surgery. Okay, Miss Debbie? Thank you so much. You're so welcome. All right. Well, thank you, Debbie. Well, we have just a couple of minutes left. And so, Debbie, that was kind of a perfect uh, segue. Um, So what are your kind of recommendations, um, LaToya, for patients that are preparing for surgery? So, sure. Thanks for asking. I think a great thing to kind of end with is something called the anesthesia checklist. And it's something that is endorsed by the American Society of Anesthesiologists, of which I am a fellow. And it's things that patients can do to prepare for anesthesia and surgery. And just quickly, you know, first of all, do your homework. You know, answer those questions. Is your physician qualified? Is the facility licensed and accredited? And are they prepared to handle any emergencies? We don't want you to have an emergency, but no one has a crystal ball. So if something happens, you want to make sure you're in a place that can take care of you. Um, You know, it's like the Army. Be the best that you can. You know, be the best you that you can be. Be as active as you can. Eat right. Get a good night's sleep. If you are a smoker, it's never too late to stop. Stop smoking as soon as possible, even if it's just a few days before your surgery, as that can positively have impacts on your oxygen levels. Um, Find out who will provide your anesthesia. Make sure that your team is led by a physician anesthesiologist. Once again, teamwork makes the dream work. Talk with your physician anesthesiologist and discuss your health, your medications, um, your fears, I also want to tell people, you know what, don't be ashamed. Share any use of recreational or illicit drugs. We are not here to judge you. We are here to keep you safe. And believe it or not, some of the substances that can be in our body can can impact things. And we just want to know about it so that we can take great care of you. On the day of the surgery, make sure that you follow your pre-surgery directions in your diet. And remember to bring a friend because, hey, we don't want you driving back home. And remember to, um, just practically speaking, wear comfortable clothing. Um, you know, do your part to be your best and know that your physician anesthesiologist has trained for this moment. 
Well, awesome. LaToya, I'm so happy that you came and joined us this morning on the show. And I think we hopefully have eased some nerves of a lot of people out there that have been nervous about any upcoming surgeries or procedures that they've had and hopefully helped with a lot of kind of the misinformation that we say happens in medicine with the rumors and things sometimes associated with anesthesia. So I thank you again for your time and your expertise today. And Jasmine, I just want to thank you again. Like you, I'm a supportive wife, a doting mother. We, we wear a lot of hats. Yes. So thank, <laughs> so thank you for the work you do in the community. And, you know, it's just really my heart's delight to be back in my home state serving the good people of Mississippi. Well, we are very happy that you came back home. And, and of course, we'll probably have LaToya on again. I'm, I'm throwing that out there for her because she did a wonderful job today. But this oh. is Southern Remedy Women's Health. It's a production of the Mississippi Public Broadcasting Think Radio and is funded in part by a grant from the University of Mississippi Medical Center and generous support from listeners like you. I'm Dr. Jasmine Kinsey. Join us Friday at 11 for Southern Remedy Women's Health on MPB Think Radio. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand.